Definitely. Us officially withdrawing from the Paris Climate Change Agreement, um, of course, makes us an observer to our future and not a real player at the table. Um, and it also has so many different implications, even though it's a voluntary commitment, us pulling back as the United States, as the biggest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the world is a major blow. Um, and it also signals that there is going to be even less of a commitment to addressing global climate change in the United States um, if we continue with a Trump administration. Now, we did know this day was coming right after the elections, and, and the withdrawal was just announced six months into Trump's first term. So what is his main argument for abandoning the accord? He says it's a job killer, you know, and he says that, of course, he's always been very big on coal. He's also very big on fracking. He's big on utilizing these finite um, fossil fuels to energize our country. And those positions around the Paris Climate Agreement mean we got to move beyond that. We want to move to more renewable and environmentally friendly solutions. Um, and he doesn't really want to do that because he feels like it's going to kill jobs, but he's not thinking about the jobs that can be created in a new economy. So let's dig deeper into that climate change in the labor market. I mean, as with any industrial revolution, you're going to have these new technologies introduced, and there are concerns about whether the clean energy sector opens up more jobs than it kills in the fossil fuel industries, and also who will have the skills to get those new jobs. What are your thoughts on those concerns? Those are real concerns. There are real concerns for real people. Some of the industries are not going to create the same amount of jobs as uh, coal, but also coal is dwindling out. And so we have to figure out a solution um, that can get us to somewhere better. And we also have to think about how we are um, training and preparing the next generation for what those jobs are going to look like and helping to make sure that we have a just transition for the workers that are already in the energy sector, especially for communities of color, black and brown community members are the least likely to work in the energy sector and even worse for the clean energy sector. So then let's look at also candidate Biden's energy and environmental proposals. What's the likelihood, not just of a return to the accord if he wins, but also what that process looked like? Well, of course, he says on day one, he's going to re-enter into the Paris Climate Agreement, which is great. Um, it's going to mean that we're going to have to go even harder on our commitments to reduce our carbon emissions. And what that looks like can be a myriad of things. It could look like um, energy efficiency projects. It could look like infrastructure development. But it also could look like some false solutions. Um, like trusting in carbon markets that can be kind of waxing and wazing and, and somewhat faulty, or even looking at um, mechanisms that are actually more dangerous um, and we haven't really tested them out enough. So we want to make sure that we're moving with caution in this process and also looking at community-based local solutions so that we're not always relying on the federal government to create a solution that will work for us. So for the member countries who remain in the Paris Accord, what are their key priorities now? I'm sure that some of the key priorities are looking at how the global community can reduce climate emissions or carbon emissions while the biggest emitter in the world is not doing its part. I'm also sure that there's going to be conversations about climate reparations that still need to happen and that we are continuing to have increasing um, natural disasters, catastrophes, heat waves that are happening all across the globe. So we have to create not just um, solutions for reducing emissions, but also solutions for adapting to the climate change that we're not stopping fast enough. And so how do you see China's role in addressing the global climate crisis? China is going to be critical and important as one of the other large emitters. We're looking at China and saying, hey, how can China, and they're already doing a lot, which is great. Um, but what does that mean as far as a global committee, 
community? What does that look like on the supply side as so many different articles and items come from China? And we're also dealing with tariffs. Um, and so how do we make sure that the energy sources that are utilized globally are also competitive and that communities that are hurt first and worst, especially in developing nations, can take advantage of these new industries and these new economies. And China has really been a leader on a lot of those fronts. So we're really looking at China to say, hey, what is the future going to hold? And China, if the U.S. does not step up, is going to end up being the leader in this um, global mission to address climate change. And just very quickly, we only have a few seconds left. On a scale of 1 to 10, just how important are environmental issues to American voters? And has that changed much in recent years? We are completely divided. I think that on the Democratic side, you have about 68% of voters who said climate change is really important, but only 11% on the Republican side. So we are completely divided in our country. Um, we see the natural disasters, but we're losing um, the amount of attention that we're putting on these things. And I think it's important that we put the two and the two together, natural disasters and our energy emergency that we're leading into. We have to do something better for our futures. All right. Thank you so much, Kerry.